Well, it's generally said that a child when studies and then goes to the college always expects to have a wonderful job, a lot of money, a, a well settled life. This is what everybody of us dream. But there are some people who have given up this life for something higher than that. Today the guest in our studio is a live example that money is not everything in the life, a better job, a, a a well-settled life is not everything what uh, makes you happy. So we'll hear more about it from him itself. So we, we have with us uh, Kamal Lochan Das today in our studio and we'll see that how he has got his journey from what we all dream of to what he has achieved today. Uh, welcome to our show today. Thank you very so, much. Uh, more than the audience, I would be very uh, happy to know well i got to know that you were in uh, merchant navy well i would just like to tell that my a uh, lot of colleagues are in merchant navy and i oh, see nice. I, I see them earning a lot i am very envious of these uh, merchant navy people they they earn a lot i mean literally a lot so first of all very curious about it such an amazing job you get to travel all around the world and you you are paid a uh, uh, exuberant amount and still you left the job uh, for being a monk so I mean what 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 inspired you to do that I mean what's there in being a monk which was not there in Merchant Navy it's always said the grass is greener on the other side of the field it was just said Merchant Navy people earn a lot do you know how, su how much suffer how much they suffer a lot <laughs> it's not just everything is money Money is the cheapest thing in this world. If you make money as the costliest thing in this world, your life will look very cheap. The costliest thing in this world is life. And money is for life. Life is not for money. That's what I understood. Well, uh, in India today, uh, money is really important, especially the new, new notes of 500 and 2000 is really important but uh, apart than that uh, I have heard that it's been around 8 to 10 years that you have uh, taken the another path of spirituality and uh, at a very young age you got in contact with uh, uh, the people who inspired you to uh, join a, a new life. Generally in young life we are all interested in other things than spirituality and uh, we have a concussion in our mind that you know the spirituality and all these things are for old age. So at such a young age uh, how did you uh, you know grasp to the spiritual yeah, The aspect? philosophy is that uh, uh, spirituality is of the old age. I am surprised that even old people are not taking up spirituality. <laughs> well, <laughs> so the very concept that spirituality is for the old age is not even there. <laughs> yes, spirituality is for the old age if that is a norm, if it is a written rule or it is an automatic phenomena, then uh, all old people should be taking up or at least a, a, a number of people should be taking up. We do not find old people taking up spirituality. So, it is just a saying oh spirituality is meant for old people actually spirituality comes from the word spirit spirit is a thing which makes you alive the very fact that we love you are speaking is because there is a spirit within you the spirit soul within you and without spirit soul you do not be even speaking our life is because of spirit and life means spirituality if somebody wants to live life they have to be spiritual Without spiritual, they cannot even live life. They cannot have life at all. So, spirituality is the thing. The problem is not with the spirituality. The problem the young generation is having a wrong conception of spirituality. When they have this wrong concept of spirituality, 
they think spirituality is a taboo, it is not for us, it is for somebody else. A spirituality is an integral part of everybody's life, like breath is an integral part of everybody's life. If you do not breathe, you cannot live. If you are not spiritual, you cannot really live, you may exist. That is wonderful. I, I would just like to uh, extend uh, my next question to a line you said just now that the young generation is having a wrong uh, perception about spirituality. Uh, I am very curious to know that when you were young because uh, I, I have to be very sure that uh, how, how did you started this journey. So, when you were young before the spiritual journey, uh, what was your uh, uh, perception towards spirituality? Were you, a, a spiritu were you from a spiritual background from your childhood itself or uh, you started at a young age? So, what was your perception as a normal person when you were uh, in your college days? Like today in, in our college, nobody thinks about spirituality. So, uh, what was your perception that time in your so, coming back uh, to your yeah, question yeah. of perception, <coughs> perception or spirituality, people these days even lack perception. <laughs> As I told, they only exist. Every intelligent being, if they are having some perception of this world, they come to the point of understanding that I am a spiritual being. It is not that I have to accept spirituality. I am a spiritual being, I so I need to be spiritual. They had to have perception, rather proper perception of life, proper perception of this world. I give you a simple example, that is, it is a spirit which is making our body live. So, if we are to live, we need to be spiritual, otherwise we can exist. So, proper perception is required. Now, coming back to your personal question that I know when did I become spiritual, it is just a journey right from my childhood, I was a very keen observer. I was always observing people, observing situations which used to happen. I always had this question, why, 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 why? And then came the Bhagavad Gita as it is in my life. You know Bhagavad Gita? Lord Krishna spoke it to Arjuna and Srila Prabhupada, the founder and chair for this International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Khan, he gave elaborate purpose to it. In my college days, I was always uh, very much introspective as well as having a perception of this world and you know, how things are happening, why people are suffering, why people in spite of trying to enjoy life, the, they are suffering in spite of people having all the assets what a person can dream of, they are suffering like anything. Huh. Then I thought there must be something which is missing in everybody's life, what is that? When I came in touch with the devotees of ISKCON and heard the lectures and read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, I found that is it. Every question of why? is answered in that book. Every question of why is answered in that book. That is amazing. Uh, I mean, I, I heard you saying Bhagavad Gita as it is. So, I would just like to know uh, what is as it is in, in Bhagavad Gita. I mean, why, why is it called Bhagavad Gita as it is? That is an important question. This word as it is, is coined by Prabhupada who gave the commentary. Bhagavad Gita has been commented by different people according to their perception, but not according to the perception of Krishna, who is a speaker of the Bhagavad Gita. Whereas Srila Prabhupada did not give his perception, he gave the perception of Krishna, the speaker himself. You may say, how sure are you about it? Exactly, I mean that, that was the next yes. thought which was coming in my mind. How sure are you, <laughs> how sure are you about that? Because one person can understand other person's heart when he really allows that person. It is said you know a wife when she loves the husband, actually wife is supposed to love the husband, <laughs> that is a different thing, but uh, uh, she understands what is going on in his heart, is not it? So, Prabhupada loves Krishna, 
is the devotee of Krishna. What is in the heart of Krishna is more important that is known as Bhavartha. Purport the commentary means Bhavartha not Shabdhartha. Shabdhartha means word to word meaning. I am speaking something the words make some meanings that is good. But one who really knows me, understands me, loves me knows my bhava and that is why Srila Prabhupada commentary can be called Bhagavad Gita as it is. That's wonderful. Uh, going forward, I would just like to know like nowadays if what we see especially in India and on uh, television, uh, the monks nowadays are not having, I mean I am not saying about all, but many monks are not having a very good reputation. Uh, many times we see that there are some scandals coming out, many times we see they are not following uh, the proper etiquettes what they are expected from. So that is why I mean personally, this is my personal perception that uh, we youth actually cannot connect with with us uh, these category of monks, uh, uh, I mean realistic way. So, when you were uh, uh, in your young age and uh, you read uh, Bhagavad Gita, was it only the book which inspired you to take this journey or was there any person also who inspired you the, for the same? And moreover, I would like to know that what uh, in a, from, from after the book, what inspired you in that person which actually inspired you to take this journey? First, let me talk about this uh, scandals and the monks. Scandals are everywhere. <laughs> the film stars they have scandals, the politicians they have scandals and uh, the government officers they have scandals. Where scandals are not there, scandals are everywhere. But when there is a scandal in the society of monks, it is a big talk. Of course, because why? It is because, because yeah. there is a great expectation Correct. that the monks should live a life of renunciation. Of course. And they are respected for it. Now, just deviating from the point what we are talking, the very fact that the monks are expected to live a very high grade of renunciation, morality and etc. And they are respected for it, it shows that that is a standard of our life for everyone. Correct. That shows, especially in the land of India, everybody knows our life is actually should be like life of renunciation. Oh. I am not able to live that life of renunciation now, that is a different case, but they are respected for it. Now, <clears throat> just because there are few monks uh, with scandals, that does not mean every monk is a scandalous person. Of course. Like you go to an IIT, uh, you find few drug addicts too. That does not mean every IIT is a drug addict. And just because you find few people who are drug addicts in IIT, that does not make you or your son or a daughter uh, not write the entrance exam for the IIT. What do you see? You see an IIT person passing out and becoming a managing director of some company, you know, establishing a big uh, industry. You see the positive examples. That is that's the a secret of uh, progressive life that you see the positive things. So, there may be some monks uh, who are caught up in some scandals and all, but at the same time you have monks like Srila Prabhupada, like Swami Vivekananda, he is a big monk. Even till today, when you take his name, people respect. Of course. Isn't it? Yeah. Srila Prabhupada, like that not one, two, there are thousands and thousands of them who led a pure life and not only led a pure life by themselves, uh, they influence people to lead pure life and a happy life. So, see the positives. So, uh, I would just also like to know that because uh, coming from your experience, because you have lived this journey, uh, you have actually lived that particular turn of your life. How do we identify that uh, the person who who, who may be following some spiritual practices, who may be a monk, is the idle person to be followed or not and how do we differentiate because uh, I do not know about others but, but if, if you ask me, uh, 
it's really difficult to i mean completely in today's world it's really difficult to differentiate between an actual monk a actual spiritual practitioner and a person who is uh, you know faking it out so what do you think what are the qualities uh, you see or uh, what are the qualities present in an actual monk to be followed which will lead us to a better life spirituality is not following a monk okay monk himself is following he is following what he is following the scriptures so the first qualification of monk is that he should follow the scriptures what he is talking about and he should talk he should say that you follow the scriptures not follow me Srila Prabhupada told become a devotee of Krishna he said read Bhagavad Gita and follow Bhagavad Gita he never ever told follow me that's amazing Whereas we follow him with faith that he uh, with faith because we 100 percent know that he is following what Krishna told in the Bhagavad Gita. But a monk by himself would never say you follow me. He would say follow the scripture. Why? I am also following the scriptures. Monk is only an example of how we can follow scripture. Amazing. He is he is not himself an example. He is just an example for us. He is not the theory. Like in science, you have your theory and an example. An example explains the theory. Example itself is not the theory. We are interested in the theory. An example for inspiration. So, monks are only for inspiration. Not meant to be followed. No, don't follow me. <laughs> well, uh, that is really well said that uh, monks follow the scriptures. Now, coming to the point of scriptures. Uh, I, I am a person, I personally uh, believe in scriptures uh, to a great extent, Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures. But uh, today because I have you in the studio, I would like to ask a very uh, old question in my mind. How do we actually, because uh, a lot of times uh, it's said that scriptures are s books written by humans uh, with their concussion in it. So, how do you uh, justify this thing that these scriptures are actually the scriptures which are uh, told by the Supreme Lord or Allah or any uh, Supreme Power and how do we actually believe th that what is said in the scriptures is what to be followed because you just now said that the monk follows the scripture and we must also follow the scripture. So, then whole attention goes on the scripture then what, what is the guarantee because of course we, we have a lot of doubts in our minds we have a lot of uh, we have cheated so many times so we need to be sure about that also. So, how, uh, what do you define as what defines the authenticity of that scripture? Okay. It came to the question of having a faith, he uses words faith. When you go to a barber shop, <coughs> he is, uh, <coughs> uh, his razor is just right on your neck. <laughs> How much faith you have in him? That this barber is not going to kill me. Correct. What is the proof that he is not going to kill you? Without actually going to the proof. <coughs> You just have faith in a barber. You, you hand it over all your life <coughs> to him. You take a car, you drive in the car. You have 100 percent faith that the truck driver is not drunk who is coming from the opposite side. Faith initially has to be there, but you should not be blind. The problem is not with having faith or not having faith the problem is with having blind faith some people go to the extent of saying that oh we do not have blind faith we do not accept this it is all blind faith you do not accept scriptures out of blind faith at the same time do not reject it with blind faith when you say that I do not want to accept it out of blind faith why are you rejecting it with blind, blind faith? So, read it first. First you read. Now comes the question of these scriptures may have been written by man. It is may have been. It is still a may. Is there any proof it is written by man? Well, uh, I mean if, if you see today any book which is being uh, read by us, 
Dan Brown or any other good novels, uh, we see that these books have been written by some author, some writer and that, I mean, it's just a analogy that it, it must be written by some person. Yeah, God is a person. <laughs> God is a person. Can he not write? If you can write, can not God write? He cannot speak. That is why in the Bhagavad Gita says, Sri Bhagavan Vacha. Bhagavan means, uh, Bhagavan Vacha means Bhagavan spoke, God spoke. Why do you make God so useless? He cannot speak and write. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, well, uh, that was a really wonderful point that we must have faith, but not blind faith. That's really a valid point. Uh, going forward, uh, if if God has written these scriptures, and as as I hear from you that scriptures are having all answers of the questions we have in the life, the the first question which comes in my mind is that then why do we have so much of problem in this world? Why there are so many different scriptures available, different religions available? Everybody now, you, you see any part of the world there is so much of violence, uh, wars going on. If uh, God has given the scriptures to us and if it's so sure to give the answers of all the questions and why there's so problem there are so many beautiful roads in this country in america in japan in china uh, but still you have chaos you still you have uh, traffic jams why because they don't follow the rules of traffic and the traffic rules change from america to india india to japan and japan to china traffic rules change the signs change everything change but whichever country you are in, follow the, follow the rules. rule of that particular yeah. country. When you drive your car following the traffic rules of that particular country, no traffic jam, <coughs> everything will be fine. So, depending on the country, depending on the civilization, depending on the, on the uh, kind of people, there are different kinds of scriptures. Well, good, no problem. Let them follow the scriptures 100 percent. Well, uh, that is very clear uh, that we are not following what what's given in the scriptures which is having the problem everywhere uh, so just to conclude i would just like to uh, ask you if if in a nutshell if you want to give some uh, quick because nowadays it's 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 the uh, world of 2 minutes noodles or uh, everything instant so if if in a nutshell if you have to give a message to our audience how a person can change his perception to accept spirituality, uh, what would be it? So, I just like to, uh, I just like you to give a message in a nutshell for our audience. Be introspective, be a keen observer and uh, inquire, inquire the truth, the truth about life. We are here, scriptures are there. We are all meant for self-realization. Yesterday somebody came and told me, oh, you are a selfless person, I am a selfish person. And I told him, no, you are a selfless person, I am a selfish person. He was shocked. <laughs> then, then he said, how, how is it so? You have dedicated your life for that, he started glorifying like anything. I told him, no. You are selfless because you don't know what is self, what? <laughs> and I am a selfish person because I know what is self. That's amazing. <laughs> Try to know about the self. That is what the Bhagavad Gita starts with. Krishna to Arjuna, Krishna tells to Arjuna who he is he, that is all. Spirituality is the most simplest thing in this world to know about yourself. We are trying to know physics, chemistry, so many things. People are trying to mug up so many things. They are, they are spending the midnight oil just to uh, pass the examination, reading so many books, 
trying to know so many things, uh, people are trying to know what is happening in the space, what is happening inside the atom, what is happening in time itself, that is the most important question. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so, I mean this is the first time I am getting a definition of being a selfish, it is about knowing about yourself first because that is important to become selfish. So that is all for today, I will just uh, wish everyone to be selfish and more and more selfish to know about yourself. So we will meet next time with some more amazing personality and try to have a new perception about spiritual life. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna.